Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're having a look at the first handheld released by Palm under its parent company, US Robotics, the Pilot 5000. It was released in March 1996 and was the beginning of arguably the most successful PDA range ever created. There had of course been other PDAs in the past and there were even other touchscreen capable PDAs such as the Apple Newton message pad which was in production from 1993 till 1998 and the Tandy Zoomer, the software of which the designers of this had already worked on. The Pilot was both smaller and lighter than its main competition at the time, the Apple message pad and the Scion 3C which was released that year. It was also significantly more powerful than a databank, making it an obvious choice for an electronic organizer. The first Windows CE devices were not going to be released for another 12 months, and so the timing of release was perfect. And while the lack of a keyboard might put some people off, with a little bit of practice, graffiti is very accurate and it'll write as fast as you can go, thanks to its 16 MHz CPU. The 5000 comes with 512K of storage, is more than enough for hundreds if not thousands of memos, diary entries, to-do lists and contacts, with the very efficient Palm OS 1 only using 42K of that precious RAM. So let's take a look. So on the front we find the pilot name and the US Robotics logo with its crisp 160 by 160 3 inch display area below which is the graffiti input area for letters and for numbers and shortcuts to applications, menu, calculator and the search function. Below that are seven physical buttons, one for the power, then we've got date book, address book, up down scroll keys, to do and memo pad, all of which will be familiar to anyone who's ever owned a palm device. Looking on the right we've got the stylus silo, the stylus itself is a good size, it's fairly inflexible, it's nice to hold, not too skinny and not telescopic. Heading around the back we've got the RAM door, so this contains the ROM and the RAM as separate chips. It's easily removed just like removing RAM in a computer. Below that we've got the reset button, the battery hatch, it takes two triple A's, and at the bottom is the connector for the cradle. On the other side we've got the contrast wheel, and nothing on the top. So let's power it on and take a look. Sliding open the battery door, we have a slightly unconventional battery setup. There is a spring for the positive terminal on the top battery, and there is a spring for the negative terminal, more conventionally, on the bottom battery. I'll flip it over so you can see the logo on startup. And we reach the calibration page. Let's pop the battery panel on and calibrate the unit. So with the touchscreen calibrated, we come to this screen. This is the preferences. From here, you can alter the time, you can set the date, and you can also set your auto power off up to three minutes. In addition, you can choose to have system sound on or off. If it is off, you won't hear any screen taps, and you can have the alarm sound off or on. It's equipped with a piezoelectric speaker, so everything is bleeps and bloops. Tapping on the top right gives us some more options, so we can set formats. You can choose your area, although on this ROM we only have three options. You can then set your standard formats for time, date, and start of the week, and your number option. Next up, we've got shortcuts. So shortcut allows you to enter a couple of letters and print a much larger option. It also allows you to do date stamps or date and timestamps or timestamps on its own. Let's create one and we'll show you how it works later. Perfect, we'll save that. It's easy enough to edit anything that's in and if you don't want it, of course you can delete it. 
it's also possible to add tabs, spaces, and enter markers. So you can create a template within shortcuts. For example, for answering the phone, you could have a standard template. Finally, under shortcuts, we've got digitizer, which we've already seen. To jump to other applications, hitting applications brings up this window rather than taking you to a system screen like in later versions of Palm OS. From here, we can access the main programs, the address book, date book, memo pad, and to-do list. We also have the calculator, preferences, hot sync, memory and security. Under hot sync, we can of course look at the hot sync log. We can set up a hot sync with a modem. And under menu, we can see that it's the first version of hot sync. Under memory, we can see that we're in system version one. It doesn't do anything tapping that. We can view the memory used and we can have everything as either records or size. So you can see that the actual operating system only uses 39K of RAM, which is very frugal indeed. From here, you can also delete any installed apps. And on this one, pressing menu doesn't do anything. Down at the bottom, we've got security. Security allows you to show or hide any private records. You can assign a password, which means that nobody can unlock them without the correct password. And assigning a password allows you to turn off and lock the device by pressing this button, and then you'll need to enter your password to get back in. Forgotten password will delete the password, but in order to get to this screen, you actually need the password. So if you forget your password, you are gonna lose everything on your palm. Clicking down here or going to applications allows us to launch the calculator. The calculator is just that, a basic calculator. There's no memory plus or minus and no root function. Pressing menu, you can copy and paste into the number box. And again, if we go to options, we can see it is version one. Down at the bottom, we've got the search function. In here, you can put in just a couple of letters and hit OK, and it'll search through all the applications for matching strings. Obviously, the longer the string, the more likely you are to get the exact file you want. Before we move on to look at the software, I'd first like to take a moment to discuss the genius input method that is graffiti. Each character only uses a single stroke, which makes it very fast, but gives it a small learning curve. However, with a couple of hours of practice, you'll be able to enter text much faster than you can using the on-screen keyboard. And within a few weeks, you'll be able to write as fast as you could on a piece of paper and with just as much accuracy. In addition, thanks to the placement of the graffiti input area, you don't actually need to look at the device to write notes. Perfect for when you're in a meeting. There have been lots of other solutions for handwriting recognition on various palm tops, including SmartWriter, Calligrapher, and Transcriber. But in my opinion, none of them offer an elegant solution like Graffiti, and none of them are as accurate, including Palm's own Graffiti 2. And I think Palm owes a large part of its success to the simplicity of Graffiti. So let's look at the four main applications. So down at the bottom, the first one is Datebook, which of course is the calendar application. Throughout all the programs, there is a very similar layout and this makes everything pretty intuitive. So top right is the category list, or in this case, the days. Top left is the page description, common buttons, so changing views, seeing details or jumping to a date are at the bottom, and any other options are found by pressing the menu button. In Datebook, it is easy to add a new entry simply by starting to write. It puts it as an untimed event, unless you've already tapped on the time. To edit your entry once you've written in what it is, simply tap details. At this point, you can choose how long the event is by using the two bars, or you can set it as no time. Then you can choose the day. So if you've entered it, say, on Wednesday, but you want it on Friday, you can simply move the date. You can add an alarm and then select how long you want it beforehand. You can set it up as a repeating or reoccurring event, so you can have it happen once a week, for example. And at the bottom, we can set it as private. Doing that, as I've said before, allows you to hide it from the security settings. Then at the bottom, we've got OK, Cancel, Delete, and Note. Note allows you to add a note or extra details about what's going on. The note will then appear as a small icon at the end. Datebook itself has a couple of views. We've got the day view and we've got a week view, so it'll show you what's going on in the week. You can also jump to a date by pressing this bottom button and simply selecting a day. 
Pressing menu allows you to see the shortcuts. So for example, for a new event, although you can just start writing, you can do an up slash and an N and that will create a new event. Therefore, you can also delete an entry, attach a note, delete a note, or purge the diary, which allows you to delete early events. So for example, if I want to delete this, instead of actually going details and delete, I can select it, do an up slash and a D and then it's gone. Under edit, we've got the usual undo, cut, copy and paste. Bear in mind, paste is a P, not a V like it would be in a keyboard shortcut. Select all keyboard, which just pops up the keyboard and under options, we can see some preferences. So the start time, end time, whether we want alarm set as standard. And finally, we can see it is version one. Just to note, if you select all on here, it doesn't select anything. Next up, we've got the address list. So here are some pre-installed ones. So this is for pilot accessories. I suspect ringing this number will no longer work, nor will this email. But if it does, please let me know, pop a comment below. So as you can see in this entry, we've got all the details and then we've got this note and we can see that it's got a note because there is a little icon there. The text bought one doesn't have a note. Instead, it's just got a lot more entries to it. So let's have a look at what we've got. Under menu, we've got the same as before. We can undo, cut, copy, paste, and bring up the keyboard. And under options, we've got list by, which allows you to select last name, first name, or company last name. Then we've got rename, custom fields. There are four custom fields altogether, so you can choose what they might be. It might be an extra mobile or an extra email or something like this. And finally, we've got about, which tells us it's version one. So let's create a new address and see how it looks. So we've got last name, first name, title. Then we've got company details. And after that, we've got a drop down list. So here we can choose what we want this to be. So it could be a work number, a home number, fax number, other, email, main, pager, and mobile. And of course, we already know that down at the bottom, there are four custom fields to add extras afterwards. So there's plenty of options here for adding different things. We've then got the address, town, county, postcode, country, and then those four optional ones. So let's just pop a quick number in here. And then we can choose a category. So we're gonna put him as a personal one and then we can tap details. And from here you can choose what you want shown in the list and also the category and then whether or not you want it private. In addition, you can delete it and you can add a note. Of course, we can add a note by simply pressing note. And again, in notes, we've got two fonts and we're done. And we're gonna save that and there we go. From here, it's easy enough to edit it or create a new one. I'll go back to the beginning. Next up, we've got the to-do list. So again, there's a couple of pre-installed to-dos and one of them has a note attached. So we can see the note simply by tapping it. And again, we can choose what font we want. Tapping on the item itself, you can show the details, you can choose your priority, you can set the category, choose a date, and finally set it as private, as well as OK, cancel, delete, and adding a note. When you've completed a task, you can simply tap the checkbox to say it's completed. This is more useful if you've changed the settings under show. So under show, we can choose to show completed items, only due items, show due dates, and show priorities. In addition, we can choose to sort by the priority or by the date. So if we uncheck completed items, it will now only show items that are not checked. So if we check that one, it'll then disappear. And of course, if we want to see them back, we can select that and they'll reappear. In addition, if we create a dated item, like so, and we set it for tomorrow, under show, if we've selected show only due items, then it will disappear and it will reappear tomorrow along with the other one that we've set for tomorrow. This is very useful. It allows you to keep track of what's actually due and it also allows you to set events for the future that will only appear when needed. 
because there are categories, you can effectively have business ones, personal ones, and then you can set other categories as well. So you can actually set up to 15 different categories. So you can effectively have 15 different to-do lists. You can look at them then individually or all at once. This actually makes the to-do application very powerful for task management. The menu is very similar to previous. We've got delete attach note, delete note, purge, which will get rid of all completed items. We can edit and under options, it tells us that this is version one. Next up, we've got the memo pad. So again, in the memo pad, we've got various categories and you can set up to 15, which means you can effectively have 15 notebooks. If we tap on an existing one, you can see it fills the screen like so, and we can scroll down and then it moves to the next memo pad if you continue to scroll. Again, we can choose what font we want, but this will apply to all of the memos in the memo pad. So you can't have some in small font and some in big. Once again, you can select details, change the category, set it as private, delete it. You'll notice you can't add a note to a note. I think that's just sensible, really. If we add a new memo, we can use our shortcut. So we do an upward swirl like so, and then we're gonna use our shortcut. And there we go. As I said before, you can also set up templates. So we'll make this one a business one. We'll hit new. And for my template, I've just made TE the shortcut. And as you can see, it puts out the date, the time, subject and outcome. And then you can simply tap where you want and fill in all the details. This makes it very useful, for example, if you've got a telephone call and you want to write down what time it was, what it's about and what you're going to do next. It is a shame that there's no natural writing for MemoPad or the ability to simply write on the screen and record it as an image. That said, once you learn graffiti, it's very fast. And by having everything as text, it keeps the file size to a minimum and so allows a lot more records to be stored as well as faster searching. Under menu, we don't have any options at all. Instead, we've just got about. It is odd is that because it means there's no shortcut for copying or pasting and there's no shortcut for deleting, etc. But of course you can use the normal shortcuts anyway. There is a limit to the size of each memo, but in general, you're not going to exceed it unless you're trying to take notes in a lecture or something similar. So there are a couple of relatively minor issues with this first version of the operating system. The first is that in Datebook, where you have overlapping entries, you can't actually see where the overlap starts and finishes in the day view. Instead, you have to pop to the week view and then you can see where they overlap. If there are three overlapping entries, it looks like this. And where there's four, it becomes very difficult to distinguish exactly what's going on. Pressing Datebook doesn't cycle through the views. Instead, it jumps to today. Pressing it again reveals any other appointment in the evening. In addition, it's not possible to copy an entire entry. Instead, it will only copy text. So as you can see, that's whatever was left on the clipboard before. And if I want to copy an entry, I can only copy the text. Paste it in. And then I need to set the time as I would usually. In the address book, if you start writing a letter, it will jump to that point in the address book and select the first one. Pressing the address book button again will cycle through all the categories. This also works in to do and in the memo pad. In to do, you can simply start writing in order to create a new task. In the to-do list, there's no way of setting a reminder. So although if they're dated, they'll only pop up when they're due, they won't actually give you any kind of reminder. So you have to manually check your to-do list. In MemoPad, you can't create a new memo by starting to write. And there's no option to sort your memos or move them into an order that you want. Instead, they are simply in the order you wrote them in. It is possible to add additional applications. Unfortunately, for Palm OS 1, there's not very many options available. So you're not going to be playing Doom on here, for example. That said, if all you're wanting is a simple organizational tool, then this is very effective. For a first attempt at a PDA, there is an awful lot to like about the pilot. 
the main four applications, datebook, address, to do, and memo pad, go on to develop new fonts and new views, but their functionality changes very little between OS 1 and OS 5. As for hardware, a 160 by 160 monochrome display was available from Palm throughout the M100, M500, and the Zaya series, the Palm Zaya 21 being the final device to include a monochrome screen, and that was only discontinued in 2005. Five. The simplicity of its software meant anyone could use it straight out of the box, and that same simplicity is mimicked in its semi-industrial design. It wasn't long before a large community developed around the pilot series, and within a few years there would be literally thousands of applications available to run on your Palm devices. Sadly, not too many actually run on OS 1. The later addition of backlights and infrared ports, colour screens and multimedia capability greatly enhanced the functionality and desirability of these devices, but I think it's pretty staggering how much Palm actually got right first time around. I'm sure many of you have owned a Palm device, or two, or in my case 10, and probably have a favourite. Pop a comment below, tell me why it's your favourite, what makes it so good. For me, while I've used lots of Palm devices, I constantly end up going back to the M500. It's simple, its monochrome screen means the battery life lasts forever, and the SD card slot means that it's easy to store extra applications and books for when I go away. If you have enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. As always, my name's Hugh, this is Handheld Computing, thanks for watching.